31. They had some TV problems with it, but ultimately they had the basis, the foundation for the Moss 44 series of rifles as early as the 1930s. And had they put more of a priority on it and actually developed it and got it into production in time to use in World War II, uh, I think it would have been a very effective rifle. Uh, it was after the war and it is more practical and more effective than the other prototype designs that the French have. Uh, in particular, it is a very simple, very rugged, and durable gun. And that's kind of a theme in a lot of French arms development. So, uh, ultimately, they did not get it done in time. Off 40, that was going through some pretty much final trials in 1940, a little bit too late. Really, the main substantial difference between the Moss 40 and the 44 here, the 40 still had a 5 round fixed magazine. Uh, after the liberation of France, specifically Saint-Étienne, they rushed to get this into production and they decided to update it with a detachable magazine. Uh, however, these did not, this production didn't come out until after the war was over. So, these didn't see any combat use, but if they'd been developed in Canada, I think they would have been uh, the best of the French development rifles. Which makes sense, because if, unless something gets screwed up, the best of the prospects is the best. All right, from Simon, uh, what is the best concealed carry handgun with historical significance? Now, I'm assuming, Simon, that what you're getting at is what's the what's the best, like, CNR style of collectible, cool, obsolete, but still functional handgun for concealed carry. And the answer is, let's be honest, no, no, no. This is kind of like saying, what's the what's the best antique car I can get uh, in order to have a safe vehicle on the highway? And the answer is, well, some are better than others, but none of them is really going to compare to the safety standards on modern production cars. And the same thing goes with handguns. Uh, the purpose of concealed carry is to have a functional utilitarian uh, weapon for self-defense. And carrying something deliberately that is old and has an aesthetic cool factor, I get it but it's counterproductive to the purpose of concealed care. So, you know, there are a lot of designs out there that will work fine uh, with an, a, an old firearm. Of course, I would strongly encourage you to have it thoroughly checked out for yourself or someone else competent to make sure that the gun is in good working order. Uh, but a lot of the older designs, and we've talked about it many times before, there has been a lot of change in firearm design in the last 50 years, not fundamentally. So, Uh, 
first one is you mentioned in one of your previous Pedersen device firing videos that it is very complicated and not likely to ever be reproduced. Can you explain why that is? And do you ever plan on doing this assembly video to give you a chance on one? I'm fascinated by the Pedersen device and would love to know more about them as the literature never shows disassembly. Uh, yes, at some point I would like to do a disassembly video on one and show you that in detail. The reason that it is complicated is that it has to be designed to have adjustable pen strips. So the way these were made is they made a whole pile of uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of patterns and devices to be issued to soldiers who have rifles. There's no effective way to actually make the pattern and its match rifle and factor to, to properly set headspace. So instead, the device had to be designed with adjustable headspace built in. And that's what makes it a complicated uh, thing to get to that. And it wasn't really meant to be disassembled in the field, so it's got a lot of small parts and tight springs. And uh, to be honest, I have yet to actually take one apart myself. So at some point, I will. Now, as for why it, I don't think it will be reproduced, that's largely not the device itself, but finding rifles to put it into. So. The issue is, in order to effectively, to economically reproduce something like that, you have to be able to make and sell a substantial number of them. If you want to make a reproduction and make 10 of them, they're going to cost $10,000 a piece. That's just how manufacturers work, at least until we have super cool computer technology added as manufacturing really up and running. Uh, however, if you want to make them affordable to the point that you can actually like make a profit doing it, instead of being that machinist who made ten Patterson devices because he just really loved the Patterson device, uh, then you have to make them uh, accessible to a lot of people. And the Patterson device is specifically designed for a 30 caliber Springfield ferret. And we don't have a good cartridge that fits that, which is that's the reason that they had to design a brand new cartridge for the Patterson device in the first place. It uses the uh, Nikon, is it the 30 caliber Nikon 18 cartridge? Uh, 72 by, for, I think it's 20 millimeters. Um, it's basically a straight wall 30 caliber cartridge. And, it, and, and it's gone, but it, the Pedersen device used it. The French basically copied it for their 1935 pistols and their 1938 submachine gun, and then nobody else ever used it after that. So that cartridge hasn't been made since probably World War II. There's, there's some surplus ammo available, but it's all collectible. There's no bulk ammo. If you're going to try and sell these things for people to actually use, you don't have a good source of ammunition for them. And there's no good substitute cartridge either. Uh, we have, first off, you're going to be limited to a 30 caliber bore. Uh, certainly, if you want it to be historically authentic and fit in a Springfield rifle, you're not going to be able to effectively do that and require people to rechamber their, you know, rebarrel their rifles for some new uh, bullet diameter, like 9mm, which would, if, if there was an original Pedersen in with a 9mm bore diameter, you'd be set because there'd be lots of options, but there aren't any 30 caliber. Uh, 32 is not 30 caliber. Um, 762 Tokrav, which is really the, the biggest, most common 30 caliber pistol cartridge, is a bottleneck case. And the whole purpose of the way that the Pedersen device worked was it had a, a proboscis, a chamber plug at the, at the front that would fit into the 36 uh, chamber. And, and, and with a straight wall 30 caliber cartridge, they were able to fit it into the profile of a 30 out 6 cartridge. The problem is that since it's a new you can't fit that into a chamber insert uh, in the same way that so you have so 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 a new one. Who is that, man? So, uh, so hard to understand. That's what they would say when you get And you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? It is here. Where is one man? Where is one man?
Gerald's books. You are terribly well-written as well known. But something is happening here, and you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? Thank you. 